Many big ideas have struggled over the centuries to dominate the planet. Fascism. Communism. Democracy. Religion. But only one has achieved total supremacy. Its compulsive attractions rob its followers of reason and good sense. It has created unsustainable inequalities that threaten to tear apart the very fabric of our society. More powerful than any cause or even religion, it has reached into every corner of the globe. It is consumerism. My name's Jonathan Porritt, and for the last three decades I've been banging on about the environment, about social justice, all that kind of stuff. I first got involved back in the 70s with Friends of the Earth and the Green Party. And since then, I've been a campaigner, candidate, I've taken direct action, I've been an advisor to government, to big business, I've written books, I've lectured, I've hectored, I've implored, deplored, you name it, I've done it. For the last 10 years, I've been working with Forum for the Future to promote the solutions to today's social and environmental problems. And I've come to realize that it's consumerism that is absolutely at the heart of this. But what is consumerism? Isn't it just a posh way to describe shopping? We're all consumers after all. We all go shopping. And society obviously couldn't function without some level of consumption. I'm not talking about consumption here. I'm talking about the idea that we should all actively be consuming more and more every year and that this is the best measure of economic progress. So consumerism puts consumption at the very heart of the modern economy and everything is done to persuade us to go and consume more. Advertising hoardings, billboards, newspapers, magazines, the TV, we are bombarded day in day out by these advertising messages. You may think they're all selling you something different, different products, different brands, different lifestyles, but at the same time they're selling one big idea that the more we consume the better our lives will be. Almost unnoticed, consumerism has become our principal pastime our zeitgeist, our ideology, all rolled into one. It's a very seductive idea. But it's also a lethal idea. We become a generation of compulsive shopaholics. Scale up all those individual acts of consumption, multiplied by several billion people, and stand back and watch the disaster unfold. The trouble is, as consumers, we don't always know the real cost of what we're buying. Now, my daughters have an absolute passion for these Braben apples. They're juicy, crunchy, but they're air freighted in from New Zealand. So God knows how much fuel has been spent to get them here into my hometown. What we really ought to be doing is buying far more of the food that we need from local farmers markets like this. That way, producers linked up with the consumer, environmental impacts are reduced, and we really do begin to understand the true cost of eating the way we eat today. It may seem ridiculous to link apples from New Zealand to global meltdown, but every little act of consumption is linked to a much bigger picture. Our love of shopping, quite literally, threatens the end of the world as we know it today. As our population grows and we go on consuming more and more, the ecosystems on which we depend are now close to collapse. Greenhouse gases are higher now than at any time in at least the past 650,000 years. The ice caps are melting, glaciers are disappearing, sea levels are rising. 
It's no longer a debate about if it's happening, but about how quickly and with what impact on our lives. No one will be immune from its effects. And it's all down to the power of modern consumerism. So how did we fall into this trap? For much of human history, the biggest problem was scarcity, experienced as poverty, hunger, deprivation. So this urge to acquire, to go beyond meeting one's basic needs, started as a survival instinct, as part of our essential human nature. As civilization advanced, life got easier, material goods became more available, but they were never what we consider plentiful, except for a tiny minority. For thousands of years, there were only a comparatively few conspicuous consumers, the rich and the powerful. For them, the trappings of luxury always had a secondary purpose. They were designed to distinguish the rulers from the ruled, to remind the powerless where the power really lay. Society was so rigidly divided that the poor accepted their lot without question and that was largely due to one very good reason. The fear of God. Most major faiths have historically stressed the importance of the community over the individual, a spiritual virtue over material success. The Quran, for example, encourages Muslims to focus on the spiritual rather than the physical world. Everything that is given to you is only the material of this life and its vanity. What is with God is far better and everlasting. The founding fathers of the Christian church railed against material consumption too. As the Bible itself says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Believers today still struggle to follow this teaching. But in the past, when religion was the force in the West, it set the tone for society. It was the power of the church that reinforced people's willingness to be satisfied with very little. Frugality, not self-interest, was the name of the game. After all, what really mattered was life after death, not a better life here on Earth. But after thousands of years, when wealth and material abundance were either unattainable or frowned upon, everything was about to change. During the 17th century, new trade routes opened up and a new middle class of traders and entrepreneurs emerged to exploit them. They had reveled in their newfound wealth. It now became respectable to consume and to flaunt one's consumption. In 1776, one man would capture this spirit of self-interested individualism. In his book, The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith argued that the pursuit of luxury worked as an economic driver that would make everybody richer. The best way to encourage economic growth is to unleash individuals to pursue their own selfish economic interests, he wrote. Adam Smith provided the model for an economic system which would take over the world. Capitalism was born. And from now on, consumerism would be at the heart of it. During the 19th century, scarcity was gradually overcome. Personal wealth and the trade it promoted drove an unparalleled economic boom that transformed the West. Giant factories were built to provide the goods that society now demanded. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution, there was a gradual shift towards mass consumerism. Mountains of manufactured goods began to appear, cheap stuff that more and more people could afford. And it felt good, as if the better life was just around the corner. And it wasn't just the production of goods which was revolutionized. The process of buying was itself transformed. After the first department store opened in 1852, shopping became a respectable leisure activity. Department stores offered a dream world of material. 
department stores offered a dream world of material luxury, promoting shopping as an experience to savor. And stores became the cathedrals for a new faith on the march. But there was one country in which shopping and consumerism would become a way of life. By the early 20th century, Americans had the highest personal wealth of any country in the world, creating huge new markets. Enterprising business people realized that they could make their fortunes by manufacturing luxury items at prices the American working classes could afford. Henry Ford's assembly line made cars which were previously the preserve of just a privileged few available to all. Many other products were soon to follow. By the 1920s, the ordinary man and woman in America had come to believe that affluence was their birthright. And to have access to consumer wealth became an integral part of the American dream. It was around this time that consumerism took a very different turn, stimulating and manipulating people's desires, spinning dreams, subtly creating envy. And as the advertising industry really took off, temptation and seduction became at least as important as providing information. Big business and its advertising agencies turned to the science of psychology. One of the pioneers was Edward Bernays, who had become known as the father of public relations. He was fascinated by the discoveries of Freud and other psychiatrists. He believed that if you understood what motivated people, you could influence their behavior without them knowing about it and cajole them into buying even more. He said, in almost every act of our daily lives, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Advertisers started to work out how to play on our subconscious. It wasn't what the product did that mattered. It was the kind of person it promised to make you feel. Consumerism was now deep inside our heads, exploiting our deepest feelings, our emotions, and even our identities. We were all being trained to desire. But consumerism didn't always go unopposed. Most famously, in the 1960s, the hippie movement rebelled against rampant capitalism. It transformed this disgust with materialism, not just into a philosophy, but into a new way of living, too. Millions attempted to drop out. It was a movement that had enormous appeal. This was pretty much the point when I first got involved, as the environment and social justice grabbed my attention and suppressed whatever shopping gene I may once have had. It all started in a comprehensive in West London where I spent 10 years of my life teaching English and drama. I wasn't exactly an out and out hippie, but even then I can remember the kids constantly taking the piss out of me for choosing to own a bicycle rather than a car, for never buying new clothes until I absolutely had to because the old ones were falling to pieces. To them, I just wasn't doing my duty as a consumer. So even in the 70s, the juggernaut of consumerism was grinding into Top Gear, and trashing the environment was almost universally accepted as a reasonable price to pay for all that increased consumption. However, by the end of the 1970s, the environmentalist message was beginning to be taken seriously. Organizations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, of which I was then the director, captured the headlines. But then, America and the West took a fateful step. A new breed of politicians dismissed environmental warnings and ushered in an age of even more rampant materialism. Hippies were now replaced by yuppies, and a new philosophy ruled, greed is good. 
Throughout the 80s, we were all encouraged to measure our success by how much we earned and how much we bought. And today's successors to Thatcher and Reagan have done little to set aside the toxic legacy of such triumphalist individualism. Such is the momentum of consumerism that nothing has been able to slow its relentless march. After 9-11, with America shaken to its core, President Bush told the nation to demonstrate they were unbowed by this assault on the American way of life by going shopping. We cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of frightening our nation to the point where we don't, uh, where we don't conduct business, where people don't shop. You can see what the president meant. Behaving normally was the best response. And normality in today's economy means being out there shopping. Nothing, not even international terrorism, would be allowed to stand between the people and their pursuit of the great American dream. The irony is that the biggest threat to the United States and to the rest of the world isn't terrorism. It's consumerism itself. We've unleashed so powerful a force that our politicians simply don't know how to get this particular genie back into its bottle. But there are practical solutions. If we have the courage to act on them now. It is now almost 250 years since the philosopher Adam Smith told us that the pursuit of wealth was not just good for the individual, but good for society too. We are all beneficiaries of that extraordinary transformation. Today we are all spoiled for choice, as long as you can afford it. And globalization means that the hamburger you buy in China will taste the same as the one you buy in the United States. Consumerism has become the global language that everyone understands. At the beginning of the 21st century, there are now more than 2 billion people able to enjoy the fruits of mass consumption. Whichever way you cut it, that's an extraordinary achievement. You just can't deny that represents progress with a capital P. But at long last, we're beginning to realize just how high a price we're having to pay for this. Visit any old landfill site and you'll begin to see what I mean. Here in Britain, we get rid of our own body weight in rubbish every seven weeks. And the amount of rubbish we throw away just keeps growing. There are 12,000 landfill sites in the UK alone dedicated to dealing with the 100 million tons of waste we produce each year. Buy it one day, chuck it the next. In our throwaway world, who cares? We throw out 1.5 million computers every year. 99% of them in perfect working order. On average, we buy a new mobile phone every 18 months leaving 90 million working handsets hoarded in cupboards up and down the country. And three million fridges are discarded every year. Every year we buy more products, more things we think we need, using more energy, creating more waste. It's this seemingly inexorable process which is now threatening life on Earth. So, am I being overdramatic? Well, just look at the evidence. What were once the dodgy projections of so-called extremists like myself on waste, energy, water and so on are now the hard-edged scientific data of government research departments. And the data's getting more frightening by the day. Across the world, more and more countries 
are following in our polluted tracks. China's economy has grown at around 10% every year for the last 15 years. The result has been an explosion in consumption. Around 250 million people now enjoy a relatively affluent lifestyle, roughly the same number as the entire population of the United States. Consumerism in the Western world took two centuries to develop. In China, it's taking less than a decade. This may be great news for a country emerging from centuries of poverty, but it comes at a serious cost. China is planning to build 10 new airports and roughly 35 new coal-fired power stations every year for the next five years. Car sales have also increased dramatically. There are now 1,000 new cars on Beijing's roads every single day. By 2015, there will be more cars in China than in the whole of the United States. So if China ever achieved the same level of car ownership as the United States, with its much bigger population, they would need to import more oil every day than is produced in the entire world every year. This is what I call impossibilism, because it literally can't be done. It just isn't possible to extend the American dream into every single corner of the planet. It won't work. If all six billion people here on Earth were to consume at the same level as we ourselves do here in the UK, we would need two more planets to provide all the necessary energy, soil, water, and raw materials to make that possible. But it's not just the planet we're damaging. Western multinationals are competing ferociously with each other to keep their consumers happy with ever lower prices. And producers in developing countries are suffering as a result. Sweatshops. Child labor. Dangerous working conditions. Scandalously low wages. The bottom end of the global market is a grim and degrading place for millions of people. But the irony is that even in the rich world, consumerism blights millions of lives too. Research has shown that once our incomes rise above a certain level, happiness has very little to do with the size of our bank balance. There's a simple reason for this. Happiness is not a question of absolute wealth, it's a question of relative wealth. In other words, how wealthy are you relative to other people? These days, just getting richer isn't the point. You've got to be better off than your neighbours, better off than your work colleagues, better off than all those people you read about or see on the telly. So this relentless pressure to earn more and buy more is ultimately self-defeating. What most of us crave is to feel safe and secure, to feel connected to others to be part of a community, to feel good about our real selves, not just about our image. But consumerism cannot meet those needs. People who are driven predominantly by material goals, by money, status, in-your-face affluence, are likely to enjoy life less than those driven by goals such as good relationships, satisfying work, real quality of life. So what can we do about this? Consumer-driven capitalism, in all its brute force, is the only economic show in town. There's no political alternative around the corner to replace it for the foreseeable future at least. So we have to make consumerism work better. Better for us, better for other people, better for the planet. And we don't have much time to do that. Consumerism can be redirected, and it's happening already. 
Let's start with what individuals can do. For one thing, it is possible to opt for a different work-life balance. Thousands of people every year are escaping the rat race by downshifting, to spend more time with families and friends. They're trading in a higher income for a higher quality of life. And even if we can't do that for personal or financial reasons, we can live our present lifestyles more ethically. We can all learn to consume more responsibly as individuals, taking the train, for instance, when possible, instead of the car. But even with the best of intentions, we often find ourselves trapped in unsustainable lifestyles, having to commute in and out of towns and cities to afford somewhere to live, unable to avoid all that wasteful packaging in supermarkets. We're all going to have to try just a bit harder. The really good news is that the technologies already exist to enable us to radically change our individual lifestyles and become more environmentally friendly. The problem is persuading people to make use of them. So I'm on my way to Sutton in Surrey to visit the UK's first and still best known sustainable housing project. Bedzed, the Beddington Zero Energy Development, is sited on reclaimed land. Built five years ago, it's designed to show that eco-construction and a green lifestyle can provide a good quality of life and be affordable too. Building materials come from local, renewable or recycled sources. Energy efficiency is an absolute priority. Heat and electricity are fueled by tree waste and each house has solar panels and triple glazing. Rainwater is recycled Domestic appliances are water efficient and low energy. And there's a car share scheme that residents really do make use of. Huran Desai co-founded Bedzed and has lived here from the start. We all had to work incredibly hard to get this project off the ground. And here, you know, we're going quite a long way to creating what is a vision for a one planet living community. I think within two, three, four, five years, you know, we will see very energy efficient homes fitted with energy efficient appliances, many more with some level of integrated renewable energy generation, whether that's solar panels or hot water, solar hot water panels or wood heating systems, or even perhaps some wind turbines on, on the roof. So, uh, you know, we will see many more of them being incorporated. But we also got to remember that actually, you know, it is our whole lifestyle that, that counts. And for instance, if you live here and, and take one overseas, you know, trip to Australia, one flight to Australia, it's as much as eight years of carbon savings here. You know, one flight, one, one, one flight, return flight, one to, return Australia. flight to Australia. Yeah, that's sort of figure. Sorry. <laughs> Is that... Even I'm a bit surprised by that. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you start getting the scale of, um, scale of the issues. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, we have to think about our whole lifestyles. We can't just think about energy efficient homes or, you know, sustainable food or increasing recycling. We have to think of it in a much more holistic way. Yeah. Four or five years ago, Bedzib was a real pioneer and it's still very inspirational today. There hasn't been a lot of progress since then, however, not many new developments of this kind. But things are now beginning to change. With rising energy prices, growing awareness about climate change, people have got the message. The truth is, however, that every new housing development, like this one here, is going to have to achieve the same levels of energy efficiency and of low-consumption lifestyles as Bedzed. As the world's resources become scarcer and energy becomes much more expensive, Developments like Bedsaid are going to make economic as well as ethical sense. New, much more efficient technologies are not the crackpot thinking of green zealots. New, much more efficient technologies are not the crackpot thinking of green zealots. These days, very hard-nosed venture capitalists are piling in with massive new investments to the tune of billions of dollars every year. These technologies are credible proven alternatives that will save us an enormous amount of money and ward off the most devastating impacts of climate change. But I'm not pretending it's easy. The scale of the problem is enormous 
and most of us won't be able to live in a place like Bedsed anytime soon. So, what else can we do? Ironically, help may come from the last place we would expect, some of the world's biggest multinationals. Last year, BP, which for decades has been draining the planet of oil, invited people to find out about their own carbon footprint. That's the amount of carbon dioxide which each of us puts into the atmosphere every year. To their astonishment, more than 400,000 people visited their website. BP's next step was to encourage customers to take more responsibility for their own carbon dioxide emissions from driving. The company calculates how much carbon dioxide is released through the use of your car. Then it asks you to offset the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide by paying a sum of money into a special fund that invests in renewable energy. You can understand people being a bit cynical about this. What? BP lecturing us about carbon dioxide when it's them that should be in the dock? But just think it through. It's BP and all those other oil companies that produce the petrol and diesel. But we're the ones that use it. These are our emissions from our cars, not BP's. This is about shared responsibility. The man in charge of BP's carbon offset scheme is Philip New. What we do is buy or, or contribute to schemes that um, will either take carbon out of the atmosphere or substitute, remove carbon that would otherwise have gone into the atmosphere had this scheme not, not, not been around. So a great example would be uh, putting in place alternative sustainable energy uh, sources in, for example, India, wind farms and such like. Um, this is not intended to be a, a simple way of letting people get off the hook and avoid their responsibilities uh, when, they, when they drive around. This is about sustainable mobility. But in the long term, it is in our interest and our shareholders' interests, uh, as well as uh, the interests of everyone on, on the planet, that uh, we start to think about how we can make our cities and our mobility more sustainable. If scientists are right in their fears about the rapid onset of climate change, then it won't be long before we're living in a world with two currencies, money and carbon. But there's obviously a problem here. If the price we pay for things more accurately reflects its real cost, then won't everything get more expensive? Well, that's true. But that's where technology comes into it, and the potential for serious technology breakthroughs. Today's economy is still scandalously inefficient in its use of energy, water, and raw materials. Yet the technologies we need already exist, and with massive new investment, they will become both more efficient and cheaper. And that's where we come to the role of government. There are roughly 22 and a half million washing machines in the UK, between them performing about six billion washes every year. Now, an inefficient washing machine uses around 100 litres per wash, an efficient one around 45 litres. So simply moving over from inefficient washing machines to efficient washing machines would save more than half of the 585 billion litres of water that we use in the UK every year just to wash our clothes. So shouldn't EU governments get this sorted out? Instead of relying on a few green consumers, why don't they impose minimum efficiency standards that all manufacturers would have to meet? That's what some people call choice editing limiting the range of choices available to us so that we can't get our hands on the kind of inefficient, wasteful machines that are still causing such environmental damage today. But so far, governments the world over have been pathetically poor at driving the kind of efficiency revolution that's required. Could it be that they're still in thrall to the old idea of consumerism? The single most important objective of almost every government today is to maximize economic growth. And politicians know that one of the easiest ways to expand the economy is to persuade people to spend more, consume more, regardless of how deep into debt that gets them. And we're already one of the most indebted nations on earth. So the people on whom we depend most for some alternative, long-term vision are the ones who are most addicted 
to this short-term consumer fix. And their pursuit of economic growth, as we know it today, reinforces the worst aspects in us, an obsessive desire to consume more in an endless but inevitably forlorn quest for a better life. But that better life will be found only if we turn our backs on today's frenetic, fast lane consumerism. We need to shift the focus away from growth as such onto personal well-being and social cohesion. We should focus on reinforcing people's deep sense of community and civic responsibility, on promoting a radically different balance between home and work life. We work longer hours than any other country in Europe, and while it makes us better off, theoretically, it doesn't make us any happier. We need to put personal fulfillment and well-being before money and self-interest, whilst protecting our children from crass commercial exploitation. What we're talking about here is a vision of a completely different world. It's a combination of two things, a different kind of politics, politics of well-being and happiness rather than of economic growth, and a different kind of consumerism living better by consuming less, however strange that may sound. It's only that combination which will get us out of today's environmental and social crises. Consumerism reborn, as it were, for a fairer, more sustainable world, ultimately for a more contented world.